This is She's on Call, a weekly show hosted by ENT specialist Dr. Sajana Chandra Shaker and general surgeon Dr. Marina Kurian. They'll be joined by guest experts to discuss an array of newsworthy medical and health issues. You're invited to ask the doctors anything. The physician and do not represent any institution. Please contact your doctor for any personal questions. Please hit share and join us live on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube at She's On Call. Hashtag She's On Call. Please welcome our hosts. Good morning. I'm Dr. Sujana Chandrasekhar. I'm an ear, nose, and throat surgeon, and, uh, and I work with ENT and Allergy Associates in Midtown Manhattan and Wayne, New Jersey. My co-host Marina is at a conference today. Uh, as I was at a conference last week, so I am flying solo today. Uh, I hope you enjoy the show. Um, today, it's April, and we're talking all about allergies. We're going to meet our wonderful guests, allergist Dr. Ujwala Kaza of ENT and Allergy Associates uh, and a clinical assistant professor at NYU Grossman School of Medicine, and Dr. Jennifer Vilwak, rhinologist and skull base surgeon, uh, who's associate professor at Kansas University Medical Center and a committee chair at the American Academy of Otolaryngic Allergy. I'll be asking them about seasonal allergies, food allergies, um, nasal polyps, sinusitis, asthma, and more. Uh, if you think other people that you know would be interested in this show, uh, please like and share and tag them. We are live on Facebook, Twitter, uh, YouTube, scroll.in and on LinkedIn on Sri Srinivasan's page. Um, we are also carried on WBAI 99.5 FM in the New York market and WBAI.org on Mondays from 2 to 3 p.m. Uh, please check in and let us know where you're watching from. Before we get to our guests, let's talk a bit about the news. And of course, as almost always, we start with a COVID update. Um, you know, we're past that one year mark of the disease, but we are still in the thick of things. There have been 138 million total worldwide cases, 3 million deaths, but over 734 million vaccine doses given. And unfortunately, the leaderboard is still uh, uh, in terms of cases, India, Brazil, and the United States of America. Um, we're also seeing that the data for cases is not as accurate as it could be because we're not having enough testing in many parts of the world. Um, we are seeing new COVID variants, which are a little worrisome. So um, since January of this year, we have a graphic that shows the variants in the United States on the left and in India on the right. And we are seeing a huge increase in the B.1.1.7 cases, which is the UK variant, and an increase in B.1, I'm sorry, B.1.526, which is a United States homegrown variant, which shares some worrisome characteristics in terms of transmissibility um, and uh, virulence or aggressiveness uh, with the Brazilian and South African variants. Um, India, which has nearly one-fifth of the world population, is seeing huge numbers of cases, and the Hindustan Times reports that a new double mutation variant called B.1.617 is becoming the most prevalent mutation there. A friend of She's On Call, Eric Feigl Ding, reported this um, and has been very accurate, unfortunately, about raising alarm bells. Um, the good news, as I said before, is that 734 million doses of vaccine have been given. The U.S. was doing really well, um, over 3 million per day, until this past week. Um, and uh, there may be some lag in reporting, but uh, I think I'm, I'm a bit worried that there's a small slowdown that may reflect some vaccine hesitancy. Um, as we know, 
the single shot AstraZeneca and Johnson and Johnson vaccines had very sporadic, very minuscule reports of blood clots. And so their distribution was halted in the um, European Union and J&J was just paused in, in the United States. So let's talk a bit about, about blood clots. This graphic is from Dr. Maria Leonor Ramos, and I added the column to the left to include the J&J &J vaccine. And it shows your risk of getting blood clots from the two vaccines um, compared to taking oral contraceptives or the birth control pill, compared to smoking, and compared to getting COVID disease. So you can see that if you get COVID, the infection, you have an, a 16.5% of developing significant blood clots. If you smoke, your risk of blood clots is 0.18%, so one-fifth of 1%. 1 if you take oral contraceptives, it's about half of that, uh, somewhere around 0.05 to 0.12%. And then from the reported cases from AstraZeneca and J&J, &J, which reflects really a very strong surveillance of our patients who are getting vaccinated, the risks are 0.0004%, and for J&J, 0.00009%. So these are very, very tiny risks of getting blood clots. Dr. Ashish Jha of uh, Brown School of Medicine uh, pointed out that all the clots we're seeing in the J&J &J vaccine are in young women, 18 to 48. And so um, he pointed out that perhaps the pause should be looking at that population, avoiding uh, vaccines in that population, but keeping it available because that single shot is really helpful uh, for people who can't come back for the second shot, migrant workers, people who can't take time off of work, um, you know, so many things. So um, I really hope that you get vaccinated. I really hope that you measure your risk accurately. If you've had the vaccine and you have severe stomach aches, headaches over the, the week or two afterwards, please see your doctor. Um, COVID is still a serious condition. We're finding more serious disease in younger people as older people have been vaccinated. I know we've covered this before, but please keep a lookout for these symptoms of COVID. Cough, shortness of breath, trouble breathing, fevers and chills, muscle or body aches, um, vomiting or diarrhea, and new loss of your sense of smell um, and taste. So um, this is really important, and I would like you to just make sure that you remember that we're still in the thick of what's going on here. Um, let's segue and uh, meet our guests. But first, we have an amazing thing that happened today, which is uh, we have our first sponsor. So our first sponsor for She's on Call um, is ENT and Allergy Associates, and uh, they have over 40 convenient locations throughout New York City, New Jersey, Westchester, and Long Island. Um, and you can book online for really high quality, same day access to ear, nose, throat, and allergy care. I want to thank ENT and Allergy for believing in us and sponsoring us uh, today. I want to urge you guys, wear your mask, wash your hands, keep your distance, get your vaccine. Um, as of April 19th, the vaccine is open to all adults in America. You don't have to be in a special group. And JAMA reported that people who exercise even brisk walk every day um, uh, have a higher chance of getting less serious COVID disease. So I took a big, long walk this morning. Um, let's meet our guests. Uh, our first guest is Dr. Ujwala Kaza, who is an allergist at ENT and Allergy Associates. And clinical faculty at NYU Grossman School of Medicine. Dr. Jennifer Vilwalk is a rhinologist and skull-based surgeon, faculty at Kansas University Medical Center in the ENT department, and um, a committee chair at the American Academy of Otolaryngic Allergy. Uh, please like and share on Facebook, Twitter, uh, YouTube, scroll dot in, and let us know where you're watching from, and please join me in welcoming our guests. Hi, Jen. Hi, Oji. 
Good morning. Good morning. It's so nice to see you guys. Um, let's start by explaining what it is you do, because um, sometimes people don't know when to see what kind of doctor. So, uh, Uji, can you let us know what it is an allergist does and what kinds of problems you take care of? Yes. So thank you for having me on today. And that's a great question because a lot of people don't know what an allergist does. So first of all, we are primary care doctors and initially, and then we really go on and we train more in allergy, asthma, and immunology. So we are asthma specialists. In addition, we treat seasonal allergies, hay fever type symptoms, year-round allergies. In addition, we treat uh, hives, which is known as urticaria, angioedema, which is also known as swelling. In addition, we treat eczema or atopic dermatitis. We treat contact allergies and we treat food allergies, drug allergies, insect allergies. And then we also are immune deficiency experts. However, people who uh, have immune deficiencies, they tend to go more to academic centers where they specialize more in this. Thank you very much. And let me ask Jen the same question. What's a rhinologist? What's the skull base? And what do people see you for? Yeah, absolutely. And I think sometimes people just see otolaryngology in general, and they're like, that is a big word, and nobody knows what it means. I will maybe not go see that doctor. <laughs> um, so uh, otolaryngology is kind of where um, people like me start off. And so that's uh, ear, nose, and throat, or head and neck surgery. And then from there, you know, there's a variety of different sub subspecialties. Mine is rhinology, which essentially means cameras in the nose with a focus on the sinuses, the nose, and the sinonasal cavity in general. And then the skull base is our fancy word for just saying basically the bone that's separating the sinuses and the sinus cavity from the brain, which is either directly above or directly behind, depending on which sinus you're in. And so there's a lot of overlap, you know, of course, between what's going on in the head and neck and then also what's going on in the lungs. And we think about that as the, quote, unified airway, meaning it's all connected. And so there are folks like me who not only have done additional training to be able to operate in the sinuses to help with things like, you know, deviated septums, turbinates or the sausages that are on the inside of the nose that help your body um, warm and humidify the air that you breathe. You know, if they get too big and they're inflamed, sometimes a surgery needs to be done to help shrink that to give you more space to um, to breathe. And so we can kind of combine our surgical expertise with some of the medical things that Uji was talking about, but certainly not all. Uh, you know, so my practice, I don't do you know the venoms. I don't do a lot with food allergy, um, but certainly I I do diagnose and treat uh, inhalant or kind of airborne allergies as well. And I, I like the concept of unified airways because um, we, we used to separate, right, when uh, air came in the front of your nose and then it got to your larynx. And then we were like, OK, now that it's in your trachea, it's something else. And I, I really like the fact that medicine has decided that we're actually a single human being and we can take care of uh, things together. Um, you know, we talked about symptoms of COVID. I, I mentioned all the symptoms of COVID earlier. And Uji, I think people are still confused. I know it's a year later, but you know, spring has sprung. And can you tell us how you know, or how you should suspect that what you're having is either a cold or flu or allergies, or maybe in fact, you have COVID? So again, that's another really good question. And even as a physician, it's not always easy to distinguish this. So I think it's just a good idea to realize that even if you're a uh, patient that, and you don't know what's going on, that's okay. And that's what we're here to help you with. So when we look at allergies, a lot of people have those classic symptoms, probably what you're experiencing right now. You can get a runny nose, stuffy nose, sneezing, itchy eyes, itchy palate or roof of your mouth, an itchy throat or itchy ears. Now, when we move on to colds or upper respiratory infections, some of the nasal symptoms are still the same, so you can get runny, stuffy, or sneezy, but you also may have a sore throat, you could have a cough, and you might have some aches as well. When we move on to the flu, these people tend to have more fevers and chills, they're very achy in general, they might be tired, they can have a sore throat, they may have a headache, and they can also have sometimes some GI symptoms such as nausea and vomiting. So when we talk about the coronavirus, these patients tend to have fevers and chills. They definitely can have headaches as well. 
They may have some trouble breathing in addition to this, and they can also have an acute loss of smell. In addition, they tend to be very fatigued in general. They might have some GI symptoms as well, such as nausea or vomiting. So, you know, um, that's that alteration in sense of smell. It sounds like something minor, but it actually can be quite major, right? So I wonder, um, Jen, if you can talk to us, because I'm hearing from patients where they had almost minimal all other symptoms, but their sense of smell and taste has never returned, or worse, they've developed this dysosmia or this like uh, wrong smell. Um, and can you talk to us a little bit about um, the problems with that change in smell? Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, issues in terms of sense of smell, you know, they've been all over the news, like you mentioned, in association with the coronavirus. But we have actually known for quite a while that there are a number of viruses that can impact the sense of smell. You know, flu virus can, you know, other coronaviruses can, but certainly, yes, it's, it's emerging as a big problem, particularly for folks that have recovered acutely from COVID and they have these long lasting issues. And nobody knows exactly why um, this has occurred. Um, initially, it can be because there's some inflammation at the level of the where the basically the olfactory stimulants or the stuff that you're smelling um, is trying to be detected by the olfactory receptor nerves. And so if there's swelling there, things don't, you know, the signal's not transmitted properly. But in a large amount of people, as you mentioned, you have the loss of sense of smell, but not a lot of the other nasal symptoms. And so it's thought that there's toxicity either to the nerves themselves or to the support cells that are around them. So then to answer your question as to, well, why is it so long lasting? You know, well, that sort of damage can take a while to recover. The good news is that we know that the receptor nerves as well as the cells that support them do regenerate over time. Um, but then to your point, well, why is it sometimes you get this bad smell? And the thought is that the signal is just not being relayed appropriately. And so that is why a lot of folks, myself included, are studying techniques such as olfactory training to see if we can reinforce the correct relay um, to help folks regain their sense of smell. And, you know, because we are She's On Call, I want to point out that it was actually Professor Claire Hopkins from England who first made that association a year ago between the lack of sense of smell and COVID-19. And I think that really helped us be able to, as Uji said, make that differentiation between cold, flu, allergy, and COVID. Um, Linda Lawrence is watching from Long Island. Thank you, Linda. Miriam Berkeley is watching from New York City. Uh, Sandra Lefkowitz is watching from Glenridge, New Jersey. Um, Amit, uh, Amitava Chakrabarthi had a question about hearing loss from COVID. And as the ear doctor on this show, I will tell you that um, the cases of hearing loss from COVID are, again, few and far between and we are treating them as we would sudden hearing loss from any other cause. We did discuss hearing loss um, with uh, Dr. Chadda and Dr. Lim a couple of episodes ago, so please go back on YouTube and watch that show. Um, let's just talk about the scope of this problem and then get into specifics. So, um, you know, environmental allergies, which, you know, it is April and it is allergy season um, in the Northern Hemisphere, so environmental allergies affect um, one in five adults in the United States. They cost four million days lost from work. Now, I'm thinking that's from when people were commuting to work, and maybe we saw less of that uh, this year as people were doing a lot of work from home. But between uh, work lost and um, over-the-counter meds and doctor visits and prescription meds, it costs the United States $8 billion a year. Um, two thirds of people with asthma have a history of allergy. And if, one, if you have children and one parent has allergies, the child has about a 50% chance of having allergies. And if both parents are allergic, the child has about 75% chance of having, having allergies. And this is from asthma and allergy network, uh, org. So um, I wonder if you can talk to us, uh, Uji, a little bit about the environmental allergies, the seasonal allergies that people are exposed to now. 
So definitely. I mean, as you mentioned, uh, allergies are very prevalent throughout the um, United States, throughout the world. And a lot of times it's hard to differentiate whether it's allergic or non-allergic in nature. And quite honestly, as Jen mentioned, that's a really good reason that we work with our ENT colleagues and we work together to find out what's going on. And what happens is, is that allergies are basically a combination of genetic environmental influences. You mentioned that, uh, you know, if you have more first degree relatives, both parents are allergic, you more have a tendency to have allergies as well. And that's true. And then, of course, seasonal allergies are typically in the spring and fall. And then you can have perennial allergic um, rhinitis as well. And those are allergens in your environment all year round. And when you come to see us, what we do is we work through that and see when you needed to be treated and with what. So, you know, there, so I think you brought up a point. So not all rhinitis or not all stuffy nose is from allergies. And I think that's really important. Maybe you can talk to us a bit about how we distinguish between allergic and non-allergic rhinitis. And I think we have a little uh, a graph about, a graphic about this. Jen, did you get... Uh, nope. Okay. Yep. So, sorry, you cut out when you were assigning who was going to talk. Was like, uh, maybe it just cut out on my end, and it'll yeah, it'll be clear. It's a who's plot. It's a plot about. against you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No. So I think you know, as Uji said, it it's not always clear cut, which is why we spend so much time, you know, actually talking to our patients. And when we think about the causes, absolutely, allergies are responsible for a lot of things. But as you mentioned, non-allergic causes are present as well. And so the non-allergic causes, you know, you can think about, you know, different stimuli that might irritate you that are not allergens or things you're having an allergic reaction to. So think about, you know, things like smoke, things like pollution, temperature change, you know, strong odors. All of those things can, you know, precipitate or worsen uh, nasal congestion and some of those other symptoms. And you can see from the graphic as well that there's a few other distinguishing factors and again, these are not, you know, an always occurring thing, but these are the things that we think about in our minds. And so usually for the non-allergic causes, these can happen later in life versus for allergies, we tend to see those show up in a number of ways early on. For a lot of little kids, if, it, if there's a, a family history of allergies, you can oftentimes actually see them start off with having things like eczema which then progress to some of the more nasal symptoms and, and sometimes asthma. So we're trying to intervene early for those folks to prevent that, that progression of disease. Um, the non-allergic symptoms as well, they, those are gonna be pretty consistent with exposure to the things that are irritating you. Whereas with allergic rhinitis, as Uji mentioned, it really depends on what you're allergic to and that can be kind of all the time um, or seasonal in nature. And so making those distinguish, making those decisions and figuring out which is which is really important because as you can imagine, the reason why you get those symptoms is very different. And so the medications and other things that we choose to try to help you is going to depend on which of those two things or which of those two categories you fall into. Thank you. Um, Uji, you actually sent me some really nice uh, graphics on uh, different seasonal allergies and different times of the year that they appear. And so maybe you can talk us through this. And, and I have to say, we're having people, uh, Margaret's checking in from Brooklyn, so that checked in from Hastings on Hudson. A lot of people are talking about how timely this show is. You know, yesterday I went walking in the park with those beautiful cherry blossoms that kind of make my throat itch. And my friends were with me and they have a dog and that kind of makes my throat itch. Um, and being outdoors was really gorgeous. Uh, but can you talk to us about these seasonal allergies and and what um, what we should look out for? Yes, definitely. So it's kind of funny because when people come in in the spring, you know that the pollens are starting to come out and they they say, "Hey, my seasonal allergies are acting up. I need treatment." So when we look at seasonal allergies, there's different pollens that pollinate at different times of the year. Typically what happens is with trees, they pollinate anywhere from March, usually a little later in March, and they'll go into June. And we talk about down south, it might be about a month or two earlier that they pollinate. And there's various trees, there's birch, there's maple, there's oak, there's elm, cottonwood, 
So hickory, lots of different trees that can pollinate. And it's really important to realize that when we look at the seasonal allergies, it's important when these pollinate. You may say trees at other times of the year, but it doesn't necessarily mean they're pollinating. When we talk about grasses, grasses typically pollinate anywhere from May into July. And these are grasses such as Timothy grass and Kentucky bluegrass. Down south, you might see Bermuda grass as well. When we talk about the fall, really mid-August um, until October, usually the pollens that pollinate are ragweed and other types of weeds. And one thing I'd just like to point out, uh, Jen had brought up earlier about allergic rhinitis and chronic rhinitis. Well, just to complicate things a little bit more, a lot of people have both. So I think that it's important for us to understand how to distinguish these uh, and then also realize that sometimes somebody may be experiencing both and we may need to treat both of these as well. Yeah, I think that's really important. Uh, we put up a little graphic on the causes and triggers of chronic rhinitis, which are not allergies, but, you know, things like certain foods and beverages, certain um, environmental like smoke and perfume, um, even lying on the one side, which makes your nose more congested than otherwise. Jen, um, I know that, uh, that OG talked about Bermuda grass in the South. Are you seeing this sort of same timeline down there in Kansas City, Kansas? You know, which freaks me out with the two Kansas cities right next to each other. <laughs> yeah, so we see, you know, our timeline is about the same. You know, there's more, I feel like there's a little bit more variation now as the weather is becoming a little bit more crazy, you know. And so, for example, like last week it was in the 80s. It's going to freeze tonight, you know, so I think that can sometimes <laughs> put things into a little bit more of an unpredictable nature. But certainly there's resources that are available as well, you know, where there's different websites and things that will show you the pollen count that will actually show you, you know, what is being detected. You know, if you're a little bit confused as to why maybe this year your allergies are starting earlier versus later. Um, and then can we talk a bit about perennial allergies, Uji? Um, what, you know, seasonal allergies occur in seasons, right? Mm -hmm. So either I have spring allergies or fall allergies or maybe both. But what if I'm sort of just stuffy nose, I'm a great, you know, tissue user all year round, my eyes are itchy all year round. What causes that? So that's a good question. Uh, before I go into that, one thing I want to quickly mention is just that as mentioned earlier, you know, pollination seasons can be a little bit different down south. So I'll have people that will come in in January and say they were in Florida and they have symptoms. And so sometimes the seasons may be longer in different parts of the country. So you may think you're actually experiencing like year round perennial aller allergic rhinitis when sometimes it may be just an extended pollen season. So when we talk about perennial allergens, I think a lot of people know some of these uh, so such as pets, cats and dogs definitely can do that. Uh, and then other uh, rare animals, sometimes guinea pigs and other things that people may have. Molds can be a perennial allergen. There are indoor molds, and those are more of a perennial allergen that will be there all year round. The outdoor molds are really more seasonal. They usually uh, start around March and they go through the fall. And then, of course, dust mites. And these are really relatives of ticks and spiders, but they do not do the same things. They really cause more of those nasal and eye symptoms. And in addition, uh, they can be found in bedding, upholstery, uh, stuffed animals, carpet, and then even on eye masks. So these are things that can be in your environment throughout the year. That's really interesting. Um, do allergies change over a person's lifetime? You know, a lot of my patients come in and say, oh, I was, you know, severely aller allergic as a child and I took shots and, you know, now I'm fine. And my husband, in fact, this happened on Friday, uh, patients that day, and my husband never had allergies. And now in his 50s and 60s, he's starting to develop allergies. Does that happen? Yes, uh, definitely. And sometimes those husbands may have had it when they're younger, but it's only when they're older that their wives drag them in to see the doctor. So um, yeah, definitely allergies can change over time. So when you're young, uh, there's a lot of people that might have allergies or they may not. For example, uh, when people have pets when they're young, they may not be allergic to them. And sometimes they'll go away to college where they're not really around the pets anymore and so their body kind of forgets about them. And when they go back home, they notice that they now have allergies to their pets. Now, it also depends on where you move. So for example, if you grew up in the Northeast, 
the ent- your entire life and then you never had allergies, but now you moved down south, you may develop them. Because allergies really are a combination of genetic and environmental influences. So they can change, whether it's a food allergy, whether it's asthma, like an allergic asthma, or um, allergic rhinitis, they can definitely change over your lifetime. Thank you. I want to remind everyone that we are live on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, scroll.in, and on Sri Srinivasan's LinkedIn page. Um, please like and share and tag your friends. Anyone who's uh, been sneezing around you or you feel like has runny red eyes, um, you know, might enjoy this show. I'm learning a lot here. Um, let's, uh, let's go back and talk a little bit about the nose itself. So, Jen. One of my favorite mom slash ENT jokes is you can pick your friends and you can pick your nose, but only an ENT surgeon can pick your friend's nose, which is a terrible joke. And I'm sorry, but I have to say it. Um, So can you tell us a little bit? You you alluded to these turbinates. um, You alluded to the anatomy of the nose, which we all think we know since it's plain as a nose on your face, but it's really not. Um, uh, I was uh, interested to learn that the surface area of the lining of the nose is about two square feet. So there's two square feet of mucosa inside my nose. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah, absolutely. And so I 100% agree that a lot of people think about the nose as being, you know, just the external part that you see. But as you mentioned, there's quite a bit of space further back. And that's where uh, most of the structures that contribute you know, to allergies, nasal obstruction, and those nasal symptoms um, stem from. So when I'm thinking about the nose, you know, I I always think, all right, well, everybody's got a septum, which is the part in the middle that separates the two sides from one another. And in a perfect world, that would be straight up and down, but we do not live in a perfect world. So a lot of people have what's called a septal deviation, where your septum is off to one side versus the other. Then what you can also see from that figure is that there are turbinates, and everybody's got three sets of them. And those are what I explain to my patients as they're kind of sausages that hang off the side and the ceiling of the nose that help to warm and humidify the air that you breathe. Now, sometimes things will inflame them and they start making more mucus. They get bigger. The mucus that's made is stickier and more irritating. And that is bothersome because, number one, you got sticky, irritating mucus. But also if the turbinates are big, you only have you know, a certain amount of space on the inside of the nose. So if the turbinates are big, now there's less space. And then if you combine that with your septum not being straight, um, now you can really be um, having some issues. The other thing that's important, too, is that everybody has sinuses, which are essentially air-filled rooms within the, the inside of the nose and in, in the skull. And they drain into the nose. And so if you have big turbinates or other things that anatomically or structurally make it so that those sinuses don't drain well, Well, now you're predisposed and more likely to get issues with, you know, sinus infection, the facial pain and pressure, um, those sorts of symptoms as well. So, you know, Sumana Ramachar just commented that one plus of wearing a mask everywhere is that she is not experiencing as much seasonal allergy. And I think we're seeing that. We're seeing no, almost no cases of flu this winter um, in the Northern Hemisphere, Uh, almost no cases of flu last winter in the southern hemisphere, which was our summer. Um, We're seeing less colds and flus overall. We're seeing less ear infections in small children. And you're right, we're just wearing masks. You wear a mask, you wear some glasses, you go about and walk around the pollen. Right, Uji? That's definitely true. There's definitely a decrease in a lot of things. Decrease in upper respiratory infections, decrease in um, the flu, decrease in asthma exacerbations from colds and allergies as well. So wearing a mask has definitely helped when you're outside uh, in terms of trying to prevent and getting sick of any time. But I think also what's really important to realize is a lot of people are spending more time indoors um, this past year. So that's also helped a lot in terms of their allergies and infections. So when I talk to people about how they did last spring, immediately what they tell me is like, well, I didn't really go outside much. So therefore, I didn't really have much in the way of my allergy symptoms. Um, So let's shift gear a little bit and talk about food allergies. Um, 15 million Americans have food allergies and about 6 million children or 1 in 13 have food allergies. Um, We have a couple of questions about them, but can you, let's start with Uji, can you tell us a bit about the difference between an actual 
food allergy and some food intolerance. And can you tell us the most common things people are actually allergic to in terms of food? So I think everyone um, knows some of the more common food allergens, for example, peanuts, tree nuts, fish, shellfish. These are uh, allergens, particularly a lot of um, people who develop them and when they're younger, these are more likely to persist into adulthood. It doesn't mean that other food allergens can't. These are just more common. Other common food allergies that tend to occur when patients are younger are milk, eggs, wheat, soy. Now, although these eight are the more common food allergens, there's definitely other food allergens out there as well. The biggest difference between a food allergy and a food intolerance is that a food allergy can put you at life-threatening risk. Now, a food intolerance will definitely not be comfortable, but it won't put you at life-threatening risk. So a classic example of a food intolerance is lactose intolerance, where you can get abdominal pain, bloating, and diarrhea and discomfort and things like that. With a food allergy, you can have um, gastrointestinal symptoms, and nausea and vomiting, but you may have things such as itchy skin, hives, swelling of your lips, tongue, throat. You may have trouble breathing. So really things that uh, signify that you might be at life-threatening risk. So we have a LinkedIn viewer who's asking, is there a relationship between immunizations and the development of uh, food allergies? Have you seen it? Have you seen something like that, Jen? No, I mean, I have, I don't, I'm not aware of any data that supports that. I mean, there are some things that have evolved kind of in, in the modern history of humanity, which are known to um, potentially increase your risk of allergies. And we call that in, in med school and, and in our training, the quote hygiene hypothesis, essentially meaning that before the, the side of our immune system that contributes to allergy was also always kind of on the prowl for things like parasites and other stuff that we were exposed to um, before we you know realized the importance of hygiene. So one of the thoughts is as our environment has become so much more clean, you know, you're washing your hands 10,000 times a day now for sure. But even before then, you know, there was a real push towards cleaning our environment. And that meant that there were some exposures that we used to get, you know, playing with dirt, eating dirt when you're young, et cetera. Or maybe that was just me. But having those early exposures can be protective against uh, the future development of allergies. And so we know that, you know, going to daycare, you know, having a pet in the homes, those things can be helpful to prevent things. And as we remove all of those stimuli early in life, that can or is thought to contribute to the development of allergies later. Yeah, there was actually a landmark study that was done in India, maybe over a decade ago now, looking at two co cohorts of children, one in a village, playing in the dirt, uh, exposed to cooking fumes, exposed to sort of life. And the other cohort were wealthy children living in air conditioned apartments who went from their apartment to their car, to their school, to their home again. And the incidence of asthma and upper respiratory aller allergic type um, diseases was actually significantly higher in the rich children. Be and and the, um, the conclusion was exactly what you said. We, they were not exposed to the normal things that trigger our immune system to react normally. Um, I thought that was really a very interesting study. So I sent my children out to go eat some dirt. Um, and if, if you're Hindu, um, every mother wants her baby to be Lord Krishna who ate dirt. So we're okay with that. Um, so Uji, can we talk a little bit about when you decide to do some testing? So when do you do testing for allergies and how do you do testing for allergies? So first of all, um, when we do testing for allergies, one of the things we look at, are you having allergic symptoms? Uh, sometimes people come in and they just have a cold and it's pretty clear that it's an upper respiratory infection. So it's not always necessary. Let's say they said, hey, about a month ago, I had seven days of uh, sore throat cough, maybe um, some chills or body aches and it went away. So when we do allergy testing, it's very important to realize that we're doing it to help us assess, do you actually have an allergy? And we have to put everything in the right context. So it's not just testing, but it's the whole story of what's going on with you that is important. So when we do testing, we can do um, what we call skin prick testing or percutaneous testing. And what that involves is little scratch tests or prick tests that we do typically either on the back or on the forearm. 
And then we wait about 15 to 20 minutes. And once you, uh, this time is done, then what you see is like a little mosquito bite type of reaction, sometimes a bigger mosquito type uh, bite of reaction. And then what we do is we assess, is this really what's happening with the patient? Is, or for example, they tested positive at trees or are they having symptoms in the spring? You can also do blood tests. These are immunocap tests. We uh, sometimes do these uh, as well. And whether we do uh, skin prick testing or immunocaps is really kind of individualized. Uh, the skin prick testing tends to be better and we can do more tests at once. However, there are times that uh, blood tests are uh, useful as well. So um, we have a few questions from the audience. So one person writes, um, she likes drinking green tea, but every time she drinks green tea, her throat hurts and um, the irritation lasts all day. So what do we do? You know, I used to never be able to eat pineapple because I would my throat would feel kind of funny. And now I find that if it's certain types of pineapple, I can eat it. So what do we do about that, Jen? Like, should she just stop drinking green tea or um, what is that? Is that an allergy? Is that an irritation? Yeah, and it can be so it can be hard to know sometimes, you know, is it something that is truly a food allergy, like Uji was saying before, where you're having kind of a life-threatening, you know, thing that could be occurring, or is there some other reason that your body is just not responding, you know, appropriately to what it is that you're ingesting? And so I think there's a couple of things that can be helpful. You know, one is to really pay close attention to what the symptoms are that you're having. You know, like this person is describing, is it happening every time that you're exposed to it? Is there anything else that's, that's going on at the same time that kind of helps put that into context. I mean, in general, if I have someone that says every time I do this, especially as an ENT where I'm always concerned about the airway, I'm like, whoa, if your throat is hurting and swelling every time, you know, that's something that you may want to consider, you know, not not consuming, you know, but there's chemicals and things and a lot of the things that we consume as well. You know, a lot of teas have tannins and things that people can be, you know, somewhat sensitive to. So, I mean, for me, out of an abundance of caution, you know, I would say you may, that's something that you might want to consider um, avoiding. And, you know, going back to the slide that you showed before of the eight major, you know, food allergens, that's just a list of the major ones. Um, you know, there's an act that will, uh, that's been passed by Congress to add sesame to that list as well. But that doesn't mean those are the only things that people can be sensitive and allergic to. And so I think, you know, you know your body best. If it's something that persistently bothers you, I would probably advise you to stay away from it. But I'm happy to hear if Uji has other thoughts as well, because she deals a little bit more with food allergy, it sounds like, than me. Well, yes. And I think there was also another question about how do you deal with food allergies? So to this morning, my friend sent me a picture of her child whose eyes are this big. And she says, I think we finally figured out that it's a shrimp allergy. So how do you figure out what you're allergic to, Uji? And then how do you deal with that? So going back to what you were talking about in terms of the green tea and pineapple, I think that for me, I the history is obviously very important. So what exactly are you experiencing? I think a lot of people label things as allergies and they'll say, my allergies, my allergies. And to me, it's actually very important. What are you experiencing? If you're just, your throat is irritated, maybe it's burning. Sometimes you may feel a tightness. That's not always allergic in nature. Sometimes that might be silent reflux. And sometimes it may be allergic in nature. So I think it's important um, when, to get a very detailed history. Now, when we talk about the pineapple, processing of foods can affect the way uh, you react to them. So, for example, in the spring, there's something called the oral allergy syndrome where certain fruits, such as raw apples, can cross-react with some of the tree pollen. So when you eat them in their raw form, you may feel an itchy mouth or throat. But when you cook it, it changes the way it looks to your body and you're able to eat it. So sometimes the way the pineapple was processed may affect it as well. So again, the actual symptoms are very important in helping to determine whether it's an allergy or not. Now, how do you deal with food allergies? Again, this goes back to history. And anything that happens to you is always very helpful if you write everything down, whether you ate something, you drank something, you took a medication that day, what environment you were in. Because let's say five months down the road, you want to seek treatment. It's always helpful for us to know exactly what you did, the time sequence and everything in order to help you out uh, 
the best way possible. Now, if you've already figured out that you have a food allergy, one of the things I'd recommend is making what's called a chef card, which will literally write down exactly what you're allergic to. And when you go to restaurants or you eat out, you make sure whoever the chef is gets to see this so that it's less likely that you'll have an accidental reaction. So, you know, there are people whose uh, Sandra Lefkowitz says, what, hap- what, do you mean, what happens if your nose runs every time you eat chicken? Or, and there are people um, like my mother who certain things that she ingests, um, she, her skin gets really blotchy. What does that mean, Uji? So a runny nose after eating does not necessarily mean an allergy. It could be part of chronic rhinitis too. So as we mentioned earlier, like spicy foods will trigger a runny nose in people. In terms of an allergy to chicken, we'd actually have to know what are the other symptoms are. We might test them. We may even consider doing a food challenge in our offices to really see whether we suspect an allergy. Sometimes we may give them a nasal spray that we use for chronic rhinitis before that and then test them and see how they do. Because if it's not an allergy, they should be able to eat it. However, again, if it's truly an allergy, they need to avoid it because it can lead to a life-threatening reaction. When you talk about blotchy skin, that gets a little bit more into um, kind of the allergic area. So that's definitely something further that I would recommend being seeing an allergist and evaluate because it's not something that you should just push through because again, if if it truly is an allergy, it can cause a life-threatening reaction. And the one thing about food allergies is they're unpredictable. It may seem mild today and next time you try it, it could be much worse and we don't really know what's going to happen. So speaking of life-threatening, I think we must uh, talk about the EpiPen. So can uh, Jen, can you talk to us about what an EpiPen is and how does one use it? Yeah, so an EpiPen is an auto-injectable form of epinephrine. And so this is kind of our go-to for folks that are in the beginning phases of anaphylaxis which is essentially when you're having a full body multi-organ system um, reaction to having been exposed to something that your body um, is allergic to. And the reason that it's so important is that this is something where the dose is already built in to the little pen. And so, you know, if you have an accidental exposure, like let's say you go to a restaurant, you know that you're allergic to, I'm going to use a common example, peanut. And for some reason that ends up in the dish that you're eating you know, you may start immediately having uh, some of the scary symptoms, you know, trouble breathing, um, you know, all the cutaneous type symptoms or skin symptoms as well. And you want to administer epinephrine to blunt the impact of that full body allergic response. Now, this is not, so this is something that you can do yourself. You can see in the picture, you kind of open it up and then you administer it into the, into the thigh. This does not mean that you do not need to still like seek additional help. This is your first step. You would do this before calling 911 and and activating other emergency services. Um, But this is very important um, in terms of helping people to not die from their anaphylactic reactions. Yeah. And one of the other things on that picture was to make sure that the cap is tight before you use the pen. So if you can stick a coin in between the end of the plunger and the thing before you plunge, Um, that's actually not usable. I'm also impressed that you can just put it through um, the pants. So the needle is strong enough to penetrate clothing. So you don't have to worry if somebody's having trouble breathing to start finding open skin uh, for injection. Um, The, there's a question about my grandmother is one, uh, Cable says my grandmother is wondering about the role of IgE and eosinophil counts in fighting allergies. So I know that's a very, like, that's a three-day seminar in and of itself, Uji, but maybe a really quick um, understanding of what IgE means and is and what eosinophils do. So IgE is an allergic antibody that we produce in our system. Eosinophils are a white blood cell, and they fight off infections such as parasitic infections. They may be elevated in very Um, various eosinophilic diseases, such as asthma, something called eosinophilic esophagitis. I think what's really important to understand is just looking at these tests, IgE and eosinophils on their own really doesn't matter. It really matters in what context you're looking at it. Is there some kind of disease process going on? Are people experiencing some kind of symptoms? Because maybe I have an IgE count of 200, an allergic antibody that's my total antibody is 200, maybe seems like a little bit, you know, reasonable amount. 
but I may not have any allergies. So it's not really an issue. So I think everything, again, goes back to the context. So when we are seeing patients, we are synthesizing everything. We're looking at skin tests, blood tests, lab tests, especially important, again, goes back to the history, what's actually happening with the person. So all of this together is how we determine how to use these tests. And Jen, can we talk about first-line treatments uh, for allergies that people commonly use even before they get to you and then what you use. And then, Uji, I'm going to ask you a bit about what immunotherapy is. But, Jen, let's start with first-line allergy treatments. Yes. So first-line allergy treatments are, at this point, they're kind of the things you see advertised for on television. And the way that I think about it in my mind is, well, where are the primary symptoms coming from? Are the most bothersome symptoms kind of the stuffy nose, the runny nose, or is it more the the sneezing, the itching, et cetera? And so for the predominantly nasal symptoms, a lot of my patients do well with nasally targeted therapies. And those are things like your nasal um, topical steroids. And so those are like fluticasone. Um, or budesonide, and they have their associated, you know, brand name medications that are advertised on television. And then additionally, um, you know, for the more kind of systemic or, or different body part reactions, the, the oral antihistamines, like your uh, cetirizine or Zyrtec, those sorts of medications are very helpful as well. Um, they do also make antihistamine nasal sprays, which I find to be very effective for a lot of my patients who have that nasal predominance of symptoms as well. Um, Going along that same topical route, there are antihistamine eye drops as well. And then one of the kind of the real workhorses of anyone with predominant nasal symptoms is also a saltwater or a saline um, rinse. And those, a lot of people are familiar with the neti pot, which looks kind of like a little teapot that you then use to irrigate your nose. It goes in the one side and comes out the other. I personally, for my body, am not a fan of the neti pot, and I prefer some of the sinus rinse kits, which are in a little flexible squeeze bottle, where instead of having to tilt your head and rely on gravity, you know, you can put the nozzle on the one side, you give it a squeeze, it goes in one side and out the other. Um, But with all of these things, you know, these are things that have to be done on a pretty consistent basis to get good effect. So what I always tell my patients is, here's a bunch of different options. But ultimately, what works best for you is the one that you can do consistently. And so we do have that talk as well. Um, I do want to mention, though, the oral and the topical decongestants. Those are not recommended for long-term daily use. It's a big no-no, especially the topical. Right. So there is something called rhinitis medicamentosa, which is a fancy word for you're using too much afrin or neosinephrine, and your nose rebounds and gets much more congested. And it's actually very difficult to recover from that because the the hit of Afrin makes you feel so good in the short term, but it's really quite bad for you when used too long. I will tell you when I have patients using the either the neti pot or the sinus rinse, I have them use it in the shower because it's a mess. It's a good disaster. So they might as well just get all wet and gunky in the shower um, and then they're done with their day. Um, OG, let's talk about immunotherapy because, you know, some at some point there are people who, for whom this is not enough. So can you tell us the different types of immunotherapy? So what is immunotherapy? Immunotherapy is actually desensitization to what you're allergic to. Important to realize when we talk about immunotherapy, for the most part, it's really environmental allergens we're talking about. So there's a classic immunotherapy that's been FDA approved and used in the United States for many years, also used around the world, what we also call allergy shots or subcutaneous immunotherapy. Now, this usually involves a weekly process of coming in and getting the shots to what you're allergic to. Eventually, after a period of time, these patients are spread out uh, to monthly shots. And usually it does take a while, at least, uh, you know, several months, uh, sometimes seven, eight months, depending on uh, the rate at which you are built up until you get to the maintenance dose, and that's kind of the target dose. Now, sublingual immunotherapy, or SLIT, is basically allergy drops or allergy um, pills that are tablets you use underneath the tongue. Important to realize there's only four tablets that are FDA approved. Two are for grass, one is for ragweed, and one is for dust mites. When we talk about drops, these are not FDA approved, and they are used around the world in Europe, for example, and typically are, uh, are used more for individual allergens. Sometimes they mix in a couple different allergens as well. 
Typically it's out of pocket because it's not FDA approved here and it's not standardized. Uh, there are people that do use that, uh, but they just uh, pay out of pocket usually the patients for this. Now, the buildup to the maintenance is quicker, but the actual uh, desensitization process where you actually have the long-term effects or even start to notice it is pretty similar between the two types of therapy. So uh, thank you so much. I think, you know, th this is the interest is amazing. People are really asking all sorts of questions. Um, I want to just proceed on to nasal polyps. So, um, you know, you talked about the normal normal mucosa, Jen, but sometimes you get these sort of fluid-filled bags of stuff in your nose. Um, can you tell us what they are and, and what people need to do about them? Yes. So nasal polyps are basically the way that the inside of your nose is saying, like, I've been exposed to something a lot that I do not like. <laughs> and so when I think about the normal lining of the nose, it should it should kind of appear like nicely applied wallpaper, you know, where, you know, there's a wall there and there's a lining on top. But it looks, you know, they look like they're one. As you progress towards all of these uh with a lot of inflammation, it then kind of becomes to look almost like bubble wrap. And that's where you're like, oh, something is starting to happen. Um, and then finally, you can get these frank polyps, which you can see on the screen there where they are like, you know, water balloons. And that's basically just a lot of inflamed tissue. And you can have them anywhere in the nose. They typically are um, in, a, in a space we call the middle meatus. And why that matters is that that's the space where most of your sinuses drain. So most of the time when we see people with polyps, it's not just that I'm looking in the nose and noticing something unusual, but they don't have any complaints. A lot of times they're complaining of a lot of chronic congestion, because as you can imagine, you've got all these water balloons that are blocking your airflow, as well as some sinus disease as well, because the sinuses just can't drain. So let's move you directly into sinusitis. So there is a question. Um, is it possible that people who have migraine or other headaches really do have a lot of sinusitis, which again, three day seminar. Um, but Jen, can you tell us what the normal sinuses look like and what sinusitis looks like and and what do you do to treat that? Yeah, absolutely. So normally the sinuses should be air filled rooms within the skull and they drain into the nose. And so as you can see on the healthy sinus side, that's that's exactly what's occurring. And you can see how fluid in there, which is naturally produced the mucus, it can move from the inside of the sinus that you see on the healthy side, just right into the nose and drain normally. Now, when you start to get blockages and, and swelling of the lining of the sinuses, now things don't drain well. You can get excess mucus that sits around, and then that's a great uh, thing that bacteria like to live in and grow, and you can get chronic infections. And for some folks, once that process has started, it's really hard to clear the infection and the inflammation. And so now it's a setup to have these symptoms continually. Now that said, you know, to answer the question that was asked, not all headache is related to the sinuses, even if it does feel like it's in the areas where you have the sinuses. Um, and so sometimes what we'll do in addition to looking in the nose with the camera is to get a CT scan as well, which basically allows us to radiographically look at what's going on inside of the sinuses. So we are almost out of time and we've had such a great conversation. Uh, I think we might have to come back with a discussion of asthma for a whole show, but I'm wondering if you can give us three quick takeaways for our audience. So let's start with you, Uji. So just uh, to start with one is if it's possible to prevent symptoms, always a good idea. So if you're going to go to a park all day and maybe want to take your medications that morning, it's much easier to uh, prevent a fire than put one out. Uh, you know, when you come home, shower, get a wash your face, wash your eyelids, get the pollens off of yourself. Second takeaway I'd say is that whenever you're experiencing symptoms, always write it down, right? What you experienced, where you experienced it, did you take medications, was it helpful, were you sneezing and having itchy eyes in the home of somebody who had a dog? Because the more you are able to tell us when you come to see us, the more help we can give you. Third thing is, is that all that glitters is not gold. You may seem to have allergies, but sometimes you may have other non-allergic conditions. In addition, you may have both. And so that's part of why we do allergy testing so that we can help you by pinpointing what's going on with you and offer you the best treatment that we can to individualize for you. Thank you. 
And Jen, I want to point out to our audience that you also host an amazing podcast called Prescription Fierce or RX Fierce with uh, your colleague, Aaron Fawcett. You've also written on nasal airway obstruction. You've edited the Otolaryngologic Clinics of North America on that. And you've edited a series for clinics on uh, intentionally shaping the future of otolaryngology. So congratulations. Um, Give us your three quick takeaways. Yeah, Uh, takeaway number one would be that you know your body best. And so if something is unusual or abnormal for you, especially in the context of everything that's going on in the world, you know, I think that warrants having a conversation with your doctor and potentially getting checked out in person. Um, takeaway number two, just like Uji said, is, you know, help help us to do the best job we can to help you. And because so much of allergy depends not only on, you know, the things that we can test you for, but what are you feeling and when, what's making it better, what's making it worse. You know, it's hard to remember stuff. So writing it down, I think, really helps everyone involved to come up with whatever the best plan for you is. And number three, I I would just say, you know, I I know that it's hard to want to make the appointments and make time for yourself to be healthy. But I think this is an important time, not just in terms of, you know, allergy, nasal polyps, asthma, et cetera. But this is a really important time to make sure that all of you is optimized to be as healthy as possible, whether that's trying to be more active, making sure that you're still, you know, getting your health maintenance, cholesterol, all of those things checked as well. Um, Because if you've got worse things going on, you know, allergies are not necessarily going to be the number one priority. Thank you very much. Thank you to both of our guests today, Dr. Ujwala Kaza of ENT and Allergy Associates and clinical professor, clinical assistant professor at NYU Grossman School of Medicine, Dr. Jennifer Vilwak, a rhinologist, skull-based surgeon, faculty at University of Kansas Medical Center and committee uh, chair at the American Academy of Otolaryngic Allergy. Um, thank you very much to our uh, first sponsor, ENT and Allergy Associates. Uh, If you have an ENT and allergy problem and you're in the tri-state area, give them a look. You can uh, schedule a same day or next day appointment with a lot of ease. Thank you so much to our production team. We couldn't do it without you. Uh, We really um, love working together and uh, thank you so much for uh, all that you do. And next week, Marina will be back. Yahoo! And we have an all Lenox Hill Hospital show. We'll have Dr. David Langer and Dr. John Bookvar, who are neurosurgeons at Lenox Hill Hospital. Marina and I are both on staff at Lenox Hill Hospital. And you may recognize these gentlemen from the Netflix show, Lenox Hill. So we will be celebrating Oscar Sunday with them. Stay safe, wear a mask, get vaccinated. See you next week.